If you've ever watched a movie and felt that warm sense of stupidity wash over you, you're probably not alone. Some filmmakers take great pleasure in befuddling audiences, as if sucking all logic out of a scene offers some perverse sense of sexual satisfaction. Here's looking at you, David Lynch. Sometimes the most confusing scenes are also the most beautiful. Sometimes they simply leave an audience wondering, uh... I'm Plumpy from WhatCulture.com and here are the 10 most confusing movie moments nobody understands. Number 10, The Architect, The Matrix Reloaded. Despite being a crucial character in a crucial scene, Architect, what the f*** are you saying? If you watch the scene with subtitles and break it down to its core parts, it makes some sense. The basic information the audience learns is this is the sixth version of The Matrix, that Neo has a choice to restart The Matrix or cause a crash that kills everyone connected to it. Simple, right? But the Rokowskis couldn't resist hiding it underneath some of the most incomprehensible dialogue in any mainstream Hollywood production ever. You haven't answered my question. Quite right. Number nine, the spider enemy. As Adam begins to assume the identity of his dead doppelganger Anthony, both played by Jake Gyllenhaal, he goes to talk to Anthony's pregnant wife Helen, only to find a gigantic tarantula in her place, which backs up against the wall as Adam looks on with what appears to be disappointment. What does a spider mean? Who the hell knows? Enemy has been called an allegory for oppression under a totalitarian state or a schizophrenic episode. The spider could represent fear of commitment or numerous other things. There's no concrete answer, but you know, cool spider, bro. Number eight, the picture. The Shining. After Jack Torrance freezes to death, the movie ends on a close-up of a picture from the Overlook Hotel, dated July 4th, 1921, with Jack amongst the party guests. This ending has confused audiences for decades because after the relatively concrete ending of Jack dying, this illusion completely upends everything the audience thought they knew. How can Jack be alive in 1921? Why is he already at the hotel? The theories are numerous, but one of the most popular suggests that Jack is a reincarnated former hotel guest, presumably the caretaker from 1921, supported by the scene where the butler tells him you've always been the caretaker as well as Stanley Kubrick letting slip that reincarnation is absolutely key to the mystery. The other most popular theory is that when Jack dies, the hotel claims his soul, absorbing him back into the hotel's furniture by forever sealing his essence inside the 1921 picture. But who knows? Well, Stanley Kubrick does, but unfortunately, he's dead. Number seven, raining frogs, Magnolia. At the end of Magnolia, frogs begin raining from the sky, interrupting suicide attempts, crashing ambulances, and basically causing chaos. But why? It's certainly easy to read the scene as nothing more than a random deus ex machina by introducing a freak phenomenon to upend all the grounded drama, and to some it may even indicate the presence of God amongst all the chaos. After all, it is one of his top ten plagues. When asked about the scene, writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson said, I'd read about Reigns of Frogs in the works of Charles Fort, who was a turn-of-the-century writer who wrote mainly about odd phenomena, so I just started writing it into the script. It wasn't until after I got through with the writing that I began to discover what it might mean, which is this, you get to a point in your life and shit is happening and everything's out of your control, and suddenly a rain of frogs just makes sense. Number six, I definitely have breast cancer. The Room. In Tommy Wiseau's weird masterpiece, at one point, Lisa's mother, Claudette, nonchalantly tells her daughter, I got the results of the test back, I definitely have breast cancer. The revelation is treated as pretty much one of those things, and then never mentioned again throughout the rest of the movie. No, but seriously, nothing, N literally nothing comes from that revelation. Was Wiseau directing an off-kilter masterpiece, a, a satire of overwrought drama, or no, he was generally trying to craft a good movie and just forgot one of his subplots. Number five, The Unicorn, Blade Runner. At the end of Ridley Scott's sci-fi epic, Deckard finds an origami unicorn in his apartment, presumably left by Officer Gaff. Deckard looks at it inquisitively as Gaff's prior comment, it's too bad she won't live, but then again, who does, rings out and Deckard and replicant Rachel leave the apartment complex. This ending has mystified audiences for years, many of whom completely miss the disturbing provocative illusion of this final scene. Gaff's unicorn could be said to reference an earlier scene where Deckard drunkenly plays the piano and has a daydream of a unicorn, but after all, how could Gaff possibly know Deckard's own personal thoughts, unless Deckard is, in fact, a replicant with pre-programmed dreams. Number four, the water puzzle, Die Hard with a Vengeance. In the third and third best Die Hard film, John McClane and Zeus are faced with a challenge from the second best groover that requires them to transfer four gallons of water from one jug to another. They solve it, but we don't actually get to see how it happens as it's basically obscured on purpose. The likely answer is the filmmakers intentionally rush through the puzzle in order to ensure a quick resolution to the scene and not bore casual film fans with the actual complex answer, but it's still really confusing. How did you solve that? It's a puzzle, we need to see it. Well, you'd actually solve the puzzle like this. First, fill the five gallon jug to the brim while the three gallon jug stays empty. Then transfer three gallons from the five gallon jug to the three gallon jug, filling it to the top, ensuring to avoid spillage. The five gallon jug now has two gallons left in it and a three gallon jug now needs to be emptied out. Pour the 
two gallons from the five gallon jug into the three gallon jug, fill the five gallon jug to the brim and pour a gallon from it into the three gallon jug, filling it to the top and again avoiding spillage, the five gallon jug now has four gallons left in it. Ta-da! Number three, Fred transforms into Pete, Lost Highway. In David Lynch's weird Lost Highway after Fred Madison is arrested for apparently killing his wife Renee, the guards check in on his cell one morning to find out that he is somehow transformed into a young auto mechanic named Pete Dayton. Even though they can't figure out how Pete got in there and what happened to Fred, Pete is released from custody. One of the more commonly accepted theories is that most of the movie is a fabrication of an insane Fred's mind and he shapeshifts in order to cope with this murder of his wife and justify it to himself. It's still not an easy conclusion to come to on first viewing. Lynch, you're a mental head perplexer. Number two, The Star Child 2001 A Space Odyssey. In one of 2001's most famous scenes after encountering a monolith, Dr. David Bowman is drawn into a stargate and shown himself at increasing ages. Finally, he's an old man in bed as the iconic monolith appears before him and he reaches for it, transforming into the Star Child, a fetus in case in an orb of light who looks down upon the earth as the movie comes to a close. See, according to the book, the monolith is, of course, an evolutionary tool from an advanced alien civilization to accelerate the progression of our species. As for the Star Child, this is merely the monolith being used to advance the human bowman into a super being. Didn't get any of that in your first watch? You're a f***ing idiot. And number one, Talking Cars, Holy Motors. At the end of Leo Carax's thoroughly mental movie, Celine drives a limousine to the Holy Motors garage. After she leaves, the limos start talking to each other, whining about their clients and expressing fear they may become obsolete soon enough. One says, men don't want visible machines anymore, and within the scope of cinema, it said that that line is an illusion, a coded slam against digital filmmaking, which is of course known for its smaller technology with greater accessibility. The limos are, by contrast, the titular Holy Motors cherish classic relics of a time gone by of shooting on film? Maybe? Literally, who knows? And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Tell us about it in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter here. I'm Plumpy from whatculture.com, and I'll see you soon.